Hi guys and welcome to another edition of Change Talks, interviews that spread ideas. And today I'm talking to Richard Bolstad. And Richard has been described as one of the finest NLP trainers on the planet and trained nearly a half of all practitioners in his native New Zealand. He is the author of a number of books including Resolve, which details his his way of working with clients and also working with victims in Sarajevo. Most recently he has been training people to help with the tsunami victims of Japan. This is a very interesting interview from a guy who is using NLP in areas where people really need it. And anyone that wants to know how to use their therapy skills in the real world need to listen to this interview. So I hope you enjoy and leave a comment with your thoughts. To take this phone call and this interview, I really appreciate it. Sure. Is the, uh, is the signal okay? Can you hear me all right? Yep, yep. Should be pretty good. It's quite fast internet speed here in Japan. So you're in Japan at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I'm here for another mm, almost two months. Oh, okay. Is that delivering trainings and things like that? Yeah, yeah. So I, over the summer uh, couple of months, I'm, I'm usually mostly in Japan and uh, uh, have a series of places that I run trainings in pretty regularly, Tokyo, Osaka, uh, Nagoya, and so on. And uh, this time I'm going away in the middle to America for, for a few days as well. Okay, cool. Well, um, I, I was speaking uh, the other day to uh, Nick Kemp, who's uh, going to be your training partner. So we're going to talk a little bit about that um, later on in the interview. But for, to start of all, for those unfamiliar with your work, I was wondering whether you can talk about how you got started and some of the important aspects of um, your journey that led you to where you are today. Sure. Um, I, I kind of uh, started off collecting other professions. I, I trained as a nurse, a psychiatric and general nurse, and I trained as a teacher. And uh, then I became kind of more interested in both cases in the in the counselling therapy sort of aspect of those of those um, careers. Right. And so, uh, so my training in psychotherapy initially was was kind of weighted towards Gestalt therapy. And I was immensely skeptical about NLP, and so, uh, like anything that I'm kind of skeptical about, I, I like to know a lot about it. And uh, the more I sort of learned about NLP, the more uh, it became irrefutable to me. So I, so I then ended up, um, uh, you know, training as a trainer in it. So, uh, so that's the kind of that's the career path that I went down. And then, uh, at the same time as I was starting NLP. Training. I was also getting involved in my other hobby, which is traditional Chinese exercise or qigong. Right. And um, and that's made a lot easier by the fact that because I'm teaching in China and Japan and uh, and in fact in Thailand each year, um, it's possible for me to to do my own training while while I'm there and training other people. So uh, then another big shift in direction came uh, after the war in Sarajevo, war in Bosnia. And uh, I had a friend over there in Sarajevo who invited me over to, to run a training for psychiatrists there. So that was the first of, well, of many trainings actually that I've done in areas where there's been some kind of major social disruption or um, a natural disaster. Mm. So that, that's a kind of <laughs> brief summary of the, of the kind of branching out. Because from, from that I got an interest in two things really, the, the trauma work and also the... Um, the conflict resolution stuff, so I'm, right. I'm really interested in that as well. So, what was it early on um, that drew you to, that got you, um, kind of sucked you in into NLP in a way? What was it? What were kind of the early things that you that you saw in it? Uh, that it was possible for someone actually to change. I, I, you know, I spent many years with people coming to sessions and measuring the sessions by um, how much screaming and crying there was, and and uh, so uh, kind of measuring the session by. Um, was there a Things scale of some sort? There was like yeah, tens of their screaming. And yeah, yeah. So some, someone who was hoarse at the end of the session. You know, <laughs> hi. So, so after um, after that, NLP was a real breath of fresh air because it it gave me the sense that uh, what we were going to do was check does this actually make a difference in the person's life. I suppose I'm I'm a pretty practical kind of person, and um, and uh, in some ways nursing sort of focused me on that, like 
um, what do you need to do to make this actually work kind of mm. thing. So, it, you know, when I'm, when I'm training and when I'm working individually with people, I lean pretty heavily on um, reliable research stuff. So I, I like to know that what I'm doing is going to work and work for them. And, uh, and I like to measure it nowadays by what happens actually in their daily life afterward. Okay. And who have, who have been your like, influences that have, that have uh, guided you to, to where you are today? Well, uh, like most people who first get into NLP, I, I was kind of enamored by, uh, by the initial books, you know, with Grinder and Bambler's um, sort of devil may care uh, attitude to everything, <laughs> including their students. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I definitely learned, learned a lot from that. I did my own trainer training with um, people like Ted James and John Overdurf, and uh, uh, there's a lot of their style that's still, still there in what I'm doing. And I, on the way, I, I kind of came to admire the work that uh, I came to admire the work that Robert Dilts was doing in the NLP community, and I came to admire the work that Steve Andreas is doing there too. The two of them, for separate reasons. Um, the thing I like about Steve Andreas is he is he's a physicist, and he is kind of determined to check out what's going on. And um, you know, as he says, we we owe it to our skepticism to to check out all of these things that we're uncertain about. So. So I, uh, I have learned a lot from, uh, from him, and then from, from Robert Diltz I pick up this uh, sense of a global mission that he has, I think, and uh, the, the idea of NLP as some kind of overarching uh, way of life, really. And okay. That's probably true for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a lot of their influences uh, can be seen in, in the work that you do today as well. It's true. There are people outside of the field of therapy that, uh, that are quite an influence on me in, in terms of spirituality, people like Jiddu Krishnamurti. But um, inside the field of therapy, I, I think it's mostly NLP people that I lean towards. Uh, I've also trained somewhat with, with some of the other Ericksonian people and uh, um, you know, people like Jeff Zeig and um, Michael Yapko right. uh, and um, Steve Gilligan. I think you could put in both those camps. And uh, they are also people that I immensely admire and uh, who, who give me a sense of how extraordinary Milton Erickson was in this whole story as well. So I haven't, I haven't trained with him, but I feel like I've gotten his influence through so many people. So I, I, you know, I keep uh, coming across people who bring novel things into the field, and um, mm. certainly over the last couple of years, Andy Austin has had a tremendous uh, influence, not just on what I do, but on uh, the way that I describe what I'm doing as well. Mm. And it's good that we keep on having those people come in into, uh, and cha- change the game a little bit. And yeah. if, like, uh, a lot of these interviews are listened to by um, sometimes new coaches and new therapists. And if, if someone wants to get really good at the skills of being a, a great change worker, what do you think that they really need to get down and practice regularly? Well, the quick answer to that would be anything, because what, what I think happens is that people... Uh, people hope that they're going to be experts because they learn more techniques mm. and I really don't think that's true um, I think <clears throat> I think we have it, this is the kind of thing I would say again and again probably in the interview, I think we have good research showing that experts actually use a different kind of strategy in their work than people who are new to a field to any field okay. so, um, so someone who's new to the field of NLP is what they're doing they're kind of matching up to what they learned on their training to a certain sequence or a certain technique, something like that. But an expert is matching up what they've got in front of them with thousands and thousands of actual cases that they've experienced. So they are uh, kind of, they, you know, if you, if you think of it as a strategy, as a tote model, they're, they're doing a different test to the newcomer. And how you get to be able to do that different test is basically by having thousands and thousands of reference experiences so that when someone starts talking with you, you feel like you're on familiar territory. And um, so that thousands of reference experiences comes from actively working with people. It comes from watching other people working, uh, reading case studies of, of people working, things like that. More, I think, than it comes from uh, from having a thousand techniques. Mm. And um, so, you know, a lot of the things that I that I encourage people to do when they first, you know, I do a lot of supervision of new uh, people, new NLP practitioners, and mostly what I'm encouraging them to do. Um, is uh, is to actually apply the presuppositions of NLP, mm. but not so much 
that this technique is amazingly better than what you're doing, or that technique would be the right one to use here. Um, I, I might occasionally say that, but mostly what I'm doing is, is about their attitude, about their uh, uh, trust in the other person's ability to make changes, um, about uh, the, the things that, that come from just working with lots of people and being at ease with it. So again, as much experience as you as you can get uh, based on your on your level of skill, essentially. Yep, and and that means I think have someone to chat to to reflect on it as well. Um, you know, in New Zealand, I don't know how the ANLP is in in Britain, but in New Zealand we have a pretty um, strict code of uh, working with uh, sort of peer support or, or supervision, you might call it in counselling terms, uh, so that people are constantly processing and, and learning from the things they do rather than just making the same mistake a thousand times as well. Because <laughs> no one wants that. Right. <laughs> no. um, I, I have your book, um, Resolve. It's a very good book. Um, and in that, you present an actual model uh, um, for working with a client. And um, mm. on your website as well, you talk briefly about a new model that you have called uh, Wheel of Change. Um, yeah. I was just wondering, um, can you talk about how you came to develop Resolve and how that kind of led on to that Wheel of Change, if you will? Well, the thing that really struck me most of all about watching uh, successful NLP uh, master practitioners and trainers working was that the techniques themselves were a very small part of what they were doing successfully. And um, these are the things, as soon as I start checking the research, it's pretty clear that helping people to focus on what their outcome is before you launch into a technique, um, uh, showing them what it's like when they go to experience a, a state or a problem before you do something and then showing them again what it's like afterwards. Um, that those kinds of things that fit around the central uh, change technique are probably more important than the actual change technique itself. Mm. So uh, uh, in a way that's what um, what Michael Hall would call the kind of meta levels of the NLP process. And um, I, I kind of have a sense that before you do the official change technique, you want to make sure that it's 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 a done thing. Mm. So that means uh, uh, checking that the person has in their model of the world and understanding that it's possible for them to make this change and an understanding that they know what it's like now so they can measure against that um, uh, afterwards. So I had an idea of this uh, model, you know, right from the start where you start in a resourceful state and right to the point where you are kind of future pacing carefully. Um, I got uh, part of that model from Ted James, uh, and uh, I'm still pleased with the Resolve model as a model of what new practitioners do, as what practitioners do. Mm. And we, the Wheel of Change model is, is kind of is more focused on uh, what's going on with the client in terms of them making change. Right. So, um, yeah, when a, when a client comes to a practitioner, they may already be quite a way through the change process, and they have particular places in the process of change that they are likely to get kind of stuck at. And so, of course, some people get stuck at the, at the point before they see a practitioner, and it's not the practitioner who, who uh, does the stuff that actually gets them to, to move. Uh, some people get stuck at this point where they, uh, they believe they have a kind of a chronic problem and uh, they just keep doing the same thing and uh, they can't seem to stop themselves. Some people actually are quite capable of getting out of that, but they are not very good at um, finding a new model, finding a new way of doing things. So there's a kind of a sequence of change, whether it's individual change or change in, in an organizational community, in fact. And understanding that sequence of change means knowing that different therapeutic stances really work more effectively at different parts of the change process and therefore more effectively with people who are if I could put it that way, kind of stuck or spending a lot of time at a particular stage of the change process. Yeah. And I think, well, I think that's important now is because, you know, we've got this enormous divergence between